In 2013, American Psychiatric Association declassified gender identity disorder, now called gender dysphoria, as a mental disorder and dropped it from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. In 2019, World Health Organization removed it from its Global Manual of Diagnoses. The 11th version of WHO's International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problems, or ICD, was published, where it's now defined as gender incongruence, or quote, a marked and persistent incongruence between a person's experienced gender and assigned sex, end quote. APA and WHO stated that this was done in order to destigmatize transgenderism and because they had, quote, better understanding that this wasn't actually a mental condition, end quote. It was taken out uh, from mental health disorders because uh, we had better understanding that this wasn't actually a mental health condition and leaving it there was causing stigma. Without any further explanation, this doesn't seem to be a sufficient reason for the classification of mental disorder. If the same was done for, let's say, schizophrenia, it would have to be backed up by clear and reliable empirical evidence, and further explanation would certainly be demanded by the public. How does this move facilitate access to mental health help, if it does it at all? Doesn't it in reality have the opposite effect? In this video, we'll look at why it should remain classified as a mental disorder, what it actually means to suffer from gender dysphoria, and how politics interferes with medicine. Definition and statistics so, what makes a mental health issue a mental disorder? WHO states on their website that mental disorders are, quote, generally characterized by a combination of abnormal thoughts, perceptions, emotions, behavior, and relationships with others, end quote. American Psychological Association defines it as, quote, any condition characterized by cognitive and emotional disturbances, abnormal behaviors, impaired functioning, or any combination of these. Such disorders cannot be accounted for solely by environmental circumstances and may involve physiological, genetic, chemical, social and other factors." End quote. And how does APA define abnormal behaviour? Quote, behaviour that is atypical or statistically uncommon within a particular culture, or that is maladaptive or detrimental to an individual or to those around that individual. End quote. According to these definitions alone, transgenderism would indeed have to be classified as a mental disorder. It does comprise abnormal behaviour that's statistically uncommon, and it may involve behaviour detrimental to an individual or to those around him, discomfort, unease and distress. Delusion is also part of it. In psychiatric terms, it means, quote, a fixed, false belief which is held despite clear evidence to the contrary, end quote. According to data from 2016, approximately 0.58% of the US population identify as transgender. Studies and surveys indicate that transgender people have an extremely high rate of suicide attempts. For example, one study showed a rate of 41% and interestingly, transitioning doesn't solve any of the mental issues. Those who transition are 19 times more likely to commit a suicide. They're also at heightened risk for substance abuse and eating disorders. This can't be blamed on the society alone, as persistence of the same issues is being reported even in the most trans-friendly cultures. The argument for the removal of gender dysphoria from mental disorders in order to destigmatize it and thus help the afflicted is therefore unsubstantiated. Previously, anyone who manifested incongruence between biological sex and experienced gender was diagnosed with gender dysphoria. As Dr. Paul McHugh, American psychiatrist, explains, Quote, this intensely felt sense of being transgendered constitutes a mental disorder in two respects. The first is that the idea of sex misalignment is simply mistaken. It does not correspond with physical reality. The second is that it can lead to grim psychological outcomes. End quote. Change in clinical diagnosis seems to be altering objective standards of human health and well-being, which might be harmful in the long run, as it actually may prevent individuals from seeking psychological help and lead them astray from the core of their issues, encourage them to treat these issues laxly or disacknowledge them. Removal of the restriction of access to hormone replacement therapy for transgender people without first having their mental health assessed and being properly diagnosed is highly unprofessional and can ruin lives, as can be seen in those who detransition. This entire progressive shift in approach seems to be a result of politics, not science. When political correctness becomes more important than health, medical practice becomes mere quackery. Many individuals start the transitioning process underage when the body undergoes significant growth and hormonal changes. It's not unusual for kids or young people to struggle with their identity as a whole in the process of its formation. The best studies show that 
quote, between 80 and 95% of children who express a discordant gender identity will come to identify with their bodily sex if natural development is allowed to proceed, end quote. Many who are encouraged to transition during this episode of their lives end up detransitioning, often with lasting harmful consequences. Some suffer from other mental disorders which underlie the identity struggle and continue or even worsen after transitioning. It should be only considered as a last resort, but due to the political pressure, psychotherapists often resort to recommendation of transitioning before any attempt at therapy. You break your, your left leg, you go into a doctor's uh, office, and under the transsexual rule of medical treatment, they say, this is your new normal and we're gonna break your right leg too. The Endocrine Society, for example, advocates irreversible treatments for people suffering from gender dysphoria, even though little is known about its causes. Patients shouldn't be treated by their therapist so as to get their desires fulfilled, but in the best way possible to help them heal and make them prosper and feel comfortable in their body. Mental health care should be grounded in reality. Why gender dysphoria remains a mental disorder? The phenomena which accompany gender dysphoria bear certain similarities with anorexia nervosa, such as disorder of assumption. That could also explain why transgender people are more prone to development of eating disorders. What happens is that, at first, people suffering from anorexia may know they aren't overweight, but feel that it is the case regardless. Consequently, these feelings may develop into the belief that they are fat, which then leads to the creation of something like an alternative reality in their minds and dissociation from the actual reality. Their actions become influenced by the alternative reality, for which it's extremely difficult to make an anorexic person change their behaviour, as the outer input contradicts their conviction about reality. Successful therapy relies on discovering the underlying issues behind the creation of this reality and its step-by-step -step transformation. In people with a gender dysphoria, a similar process takes place. Although they know they are not the opposite sex, their feelings about it eventually overwhelm them and they come to identify with the opposite sex. Approximately the same takes place in people with body dysmorphia or body integrity identity disorder. In neither of the disorders, physical intervention achieves complete removal of the concomitant issues. If we, for example, performed an amputation on a person with body integrity identity disorder, it would alleviate their distress for a while but would do nothing to resolve the underlying psychological issues. It's also important to note that there is no possible way to change a man into a woman or vice versa. No matter what anyone feels like, facts cannot be changed by feelings. You will always have the sex you were born with. Calling men women and vice versa is therefore denial of reality. The reproductive roles of males and females underlie the conceptual basis for the differentiation between the two, which is reflected in both human and animal behaviour. The Organisation for Reproduction also determines secondary sex differentiation and other bodily differences ranging from the molecular level to tissues and organs. These differences not only affect our physiology, but also our minds. All in all, symptoms accompanying gender dysphoria indeed do put it in the category of mental disorders. Children and gender dysphoria Biology doesn't determine development of gender dysphoria, but biological factors may predispose someone to it. For example, boys tend to have higher activity level, which is largely determined by genetic and prenatal hormonal influences. Boys with lower activity level might be more inclined to play with girls, for which they may adopt activities girls engage in, such as playing with dolls. This might lead to the conclusion that if most of my friends are girls and I like playing with dolls and don't like rough and tumble play, I must be a girl. This is obviously false. It's perfectly normal for boys to be sensitive and it doesn't make them a girl. Apart from biology, development of gender dysphoria in children is also influenced by social factors, co-occurring psychopathologies and family dynamics. They might want to become the opposite gender because of, for example, the belief that their parents prefer their sibling of the opposite sex, it's easier to be a girl or a boy because they are bullied, or don't find the activities their sex usually engages in interesting. They don't yet fully comprehend what it means to be male or female. Children often believe that if they dressed up as the opposite sex, they would become it. Therefore, the therapeutic approach should consist of reconciliation of the child with their body and individual traits, rather than hormonal therapy, which is superfluous in the majority of cases and may have detrimental effects on the child's healthy development. Poorly taken decisions of the parents can destroy the future life of the child if they happen to grow out of gender dysphoria but won't be able to revert the effects of cross-sex hormones intake or puberty blockers. 
this new trend where celebrities are coming out. And I know Charlize Theron did this a few a few weeks ago and saying that their child is picking their gender. And this is strange to me just because I, and they say, oh, I looked at my child. My child was swimming in a bathtub and looked up and said, mommy, I'm a boy. And that's weird to me because even though I'm not a parent, I nannied for uh, five years of my life. And the things that come out of children's mouth, like they are just, they say whatever in the moment. You don't know what they've seen on TV, what got in their head. And I've had children say they were mermaids. I've had children say (laughs) they could fly and jump off of a staircase. And thank God I caught him, right? Because he thought he could be Superman. And so I'm trying to understand this new Hollywood mentality where they just think that their children now uh, have the mental authority. Causation in adulthood and psychoanalysis. The desire to become the opposite sex may be rooted in past trauma and emotional instability, which may stem from, for example, a difficult childhood. Various studies have reported increased rates of sexual abuse, more than 50% specifically, in individuals with gender dysphoria. Sexual abuse is also linked with higher proclivity to development of anxiety and depression in adulthood. Although as of today, exact causes of gender dysphoria are unknown, I will attempt to figure out possible causes and make a psychoanalytical overview of the disorder. Disorders arising from a subconscious attempt to push away the current identity represent a desire to rid oneself of the traits one perceives as associated with it. Some experiences, such as sexual or physical abuse, must have caused the transgender person to despise these traits, such as oversensitivity, deem them as one's weakness or a direct or indirect cause of the issue's experience. This may be the root of the appearance of the desire to switch these traits, both psychological and physical, for their opposite, as those are perceived as providing what the current traits cannot. These feelings may then eventually develop into disorder of assumption I discussed before and lead to development of other mental issues, such as dissociation, which is highly prevalent in the transgender population. This could be also interpreted as the possession of the ego by the anima, the female counterpart of the psyche in males, or animus, the male counterpart in females. Dreams have the ability to bring into the consciousness the causal factors in a neurosis, that is, any conflict in the psyche. A female patient suffering from gender dysphoria reported the following dream. She was being chased by a little girl who looked like her when she was small. The dreamer was hiding in her mother's bedroom, shouting for help while the girl was trying to break down the door. In the end, ambulance came and two men, dressed in white, took the girl away, who became limp when they carried her off. The dreamer reported feeling both sadness and relief. The girl clearly represents the feminine traits repressed by the dreamer. We can conclude that this might have arisen from an event or events that occurred in the dreamer's childhood. The dreamer is hiding in her mother's bedroom, which can either indicate presence of the mother complex, that is, the mother had to do with the issues suffered in the childhood, or slash and, the mother's bedroom represents the dreamer's body, and the girl the anima, who is denied integration into the consciousness by the dreamer. Both the bedroom and the girl are symbolic aspects of the mother archetype, and the conflict between the two symbols that should naturally belong together underlies the dreamer's neurosis. This conflict is perpetuated by the dreamer, who calls for help, the ambulance comes, so we can say that the dreamer called for the two men, and the two men represent the masculine traits, vigorously taking over the feminine completely. The mother symbol represents the place of origin, the substance and nature, the lower body, and the unconscious and instinctual life. I discussed this in regard to a fictional character in a previous video, while the father symbol is the creative principle, freedom of spirit from the matter, the conscious life and the rational. The masculine paralyzes the feminine, which could be seen as the attempt of the dreamer's consciousness, the masculine principle, to rid itself of the feminine traits, or the original identity. Interestingly, this dream took place when the dreamer got her first testosterone injection, as if the subconscious were trying to communicate the message that this will only lead to further schism between the masculine and the feminine. A short touch on politics. Transgender athletes who are biological males triumph in women's sports because of their biology, which simply can't be changed completely by any medical intervention. Right now, biological boys are being allowed to set records on the girls' team deleting girls' records, erasing the achievements of actual girls, and setting a standard probably no girl can meet, no matter how much she trains or how hard she tries. If they were to compete amongst other males, they wouldn't be winning, but women have no chance against them. And what's worse, instead of facing the reality of these issues, 
Anyone who points them out is now accused of discrimination, called a name and dismissed. Maybe worst of all, when girls try to object, we may point out the truth that biological differences in strength and speed between boys and girls are massive and real, we're called bigots. As there is simply no way to make a man out of a woman and vice versa, when it comes to sports or bathrooms, it's self-evident that there should be two categories determined by each of the two sexes. Intersex is a condition, mind you, and this should be kept the way it is in order to maintain respect towards everyone and equality of opportunity. Altering the laws of speech in order to accommodate certain groups seems contrary to reason, as we can never discern individual personality through group identity. For example, if there's a transgender person harassed, we can't say he was harassed because he was transgender, just like we can't say a poor person got killed because he was poor. In any case, it's individual cases that must be analysed. There are universal human rights because we're all humans. Once there start being different rights or requirements for different humans based on what group they belong to, chaos will surge. With this attitude from the public, it's very easy to assume false victimhood or accuse someone without proof, and that's what's currently happening on the social media. But since it's a very large and complex topic, I'll address politics and group identity in a separate video. What I think is truly needed is to make sure that transgender people receive proper psychotherapy aimed at reconciliation between the perception of their body and their self, resolution of the underlying disorder, or at least of the accompanying issues, rather than being led towards irreversible decisions capable of destroying their lives under the veil of tolerance if other options haven't been exhausted. The psychotherapeutic approach must be changed. All right. Thank you for watching. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up and press the subscribe button. You can now also support me on Patreon and you can find the link in the description. Make sure to leave some feedback in the comments and see you in the next video. Take care of yourself and farewell.